Well, again, good afternoon or good morning to you, depending on where you're dialing in from today. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Martha Lazarus, and this is the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. This is our Workshop Wednesdays webinar series. So thank you so much for joining us today. We're excited about our webinar today. Um, just a few logistics before we get into the content. Um, so this webinar, as you just heard, will be recorded. It will be posted to our YouTube channel at the beginning of next month. My colleague, Sean Forbes, who is on the line, just posted uh, the link to our YouTube channel where you can find all of our previously recorded webinars. Um, and again, as well as this one um, at the beginning of November, it will be uploaded to our YouTube playlist. Um, a follow-up email will be sent with the slides that we use today, so please don't feel like you have to write everything down that you see on the screen. Um, I will be sharing a slide deck for some of the presentation today. Um, so we'll send a follow-up email to all registered attendees uh, for today's webinar. And then we also have a Q&A box. As you're listening to, the, to today's presentation, if you have any questions that come up, feel free to use the Q&A box to ask those questions. My colleague, Sean, will be responding to most of those questions by text. Uh, we might have time if there are any that I can answer verbally at the end. Um, and then we have a few guest speakers on the line today. If you do have any questions directed um, specifically towards any of them about anything that they share, feel free to ask that in the Q&A. And again, we'll try to get to those at the end as well. Um, so with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get into today's content. Um, again, my name is Marla Lazarus, and I work in the Division of Global Hiring and Outreach. So we're responsible for all of our recruitment and outreach um, for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And today is going to be a little bit applicable to CMS, but really applicable to any um, federal recruitment or, or federal hiring that you may be interested in. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about CMS, just kind of a very quick overview. We're going to talk about federal resume writing, the USA Jobs application process, and the Pathways programs for students and recent graduates. So hopefully that is what you thought you signed up for today, and hopefully you get a lot out of today's information. So getting right into it, um, CMS, we are one agency under the Department of Health and Human Services, and we are the largest purchaser of health care in the entire world. Um, CMS oversees the Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, and the Federal Health Insurance Exchanges. Um, and combined, our programs touch the lives of nearly 150 million Americans. And of course, um, we work, are working to ensure healthcare coverage for everyone, all of our beneficiaries, and reducing health disparities within the healthcare marketplace. So we are headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland, in a city called Woodlawn, which is right outside of Baltimore City. Um, and then we also have 10 regional offices around the country as well, as well as an office in Puerto Rico. So you can see the different cities that we're located in on this screen. Um, and again, just a reminder that we will be sharing these slides um, after the presentation today. And then just kind of a general overview. So obviously we are a health policy focused organization, right? So we hire a lot of health policy, health admin type of folks, but that is not all that we hire. So you can see here, just kind of a snapshot, the different types of positions that we hire for. This is not an all-inclusive list, um, but a, a good kind of summary. So we hire, like I said, a lot of health admin and policy folks. These are some of our main position titles that you'll see. So health insurance specialists, social science research analysts are two of our main position titles that we use within the agency. But we also have a huge media and communications department where we hire kind of public affairs um, specialists, um, graphic designers, that type of thing. Uh, we also have a huge business finance and program support kind of operational center, right? So we hire contracts, acquisitions, um, financial management specialists, accountants, auditors, obviously HR, that's where I work. Um, budget analysts, so all the kind of the just the gamut of whatever a normal organization kind of operationally would hire, we hire at CMS as well. And then we have a large kind of STEM contingency at our agency, so a lot of a uh, huge IT department with a lot of different specialties. We hire actuaries, statisticians, economists, um, and data scientists is actually a position title that has kind of been emerging over the last couple of years at our agency. And so we are hiring more and more data scientists within our agency as well. 
So again, that's just kind of a quick overview of CMS. It's not to, to go in depth, just to kind of give you a starting point if you're not familiar with our agency. Um, and now before we get into our next uh, or our, kind of our first real topic, um, I wanted to bring um, in some of our uh, program area uh, kind of specialists. So we, so this particular webinar was geared toward minority serving institutions. Um, we actually have a very large contingency of employee resource groups at our agency. Um, and so the folks that are on the line um, today, and, and one of them we'll be getting into our employee resource groups are from our American Indian and Alaska Native resource group. And so um, that being said though, they all work in our program area, right? So I'm from our HR center. I kind of talk about resumes and USA jobs all the time. Um, but we love to bring people in that can kind of share their uh, expertise and their stories about how they got to CMS that work on our program. So our first um, testimony today will be from Rachel Ryan Pedersen from our Center for Medicare, I'm sorry, Medicaid and CHIP Services. So Rachel, take it away. Thanks, Marla. Hi, everybody. Um, as Marla said, my name is Rachel Ryan Pedersen. I work for the Centers for Medicaid and CHIP Services. And within that center, I work in the Division of Tribal Affairs. Um, my colleague, Dr. Carroll and Georgie will go over their experiences. And I think Dr. Carroll will probably go into more information about our employee resource group. Um, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of background on, on me and how I came to be at CMS. Um, I'm actually an attorney by background and I started working with veterans at my law school's legal clinic, um, working on treatment court issues and um, benefits appeals. So nothing, nothing that had to do anything with CMS or Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and I got really interested in working in Indian law and came um, into that world through an internship at the Department of Veterans Affairs in DC. Um, and in my final year of law school, I, I really wanted to stay in public service and I really enjoyed my work with the government as an intern and I actually came on during, um, in 2012, during a higher federal hiring freeze. So one of the only ways to get into the government was through sort of these special pathways, which I know that Marla will cover. Um, so I applied for the presidential management fellowship in my um, fall of my last year of law school and was able to um, sort of compete for opportunities within like a special pool of, um, of jobs that were PMF. So I kind of got to kind of end run around the federal hiring freeze, which was very convenient. Um, I had some opportunities to work with VA, but I felt very drawn to working specifically with Indian Health. And in speaking with um, a colleague of mine who just retired, actually, who interviewed me for this job at CMS Tribal Affairs, and in speaking with some of the other folks in the office, it just felt like a really welcoming and friendly place to work. And I just had a really um, I just had a really good feeling about it. So I kind of trusted my gut and took that um, CMS opportunity, even though uh, I didn't even know what the difference was between Medicaid and Medicare uh, at the time. So I had to do quite a bit of research before I came into CMS. Um, I, like I said, I just felt very, I felt very drawn to the, to the mission of providing healthcare and especially to our, our tribal communities. And I really liked the idea of coming into a space that had a dedicated tribal office. Um, and my boss, um, Kitty Marks, who's the director of our office, was really flexible with me as a, a recent student to specifically design a flexible and diverse PMF experience. Um, she allowed me to do um, three rotations in the field. So I got to go to Michigan and work at a VA hospital with a former colleague of mine um, who actually was Native herself. So I got to do a lot of tribal veterans work, which is what I was most familiar with at the time. Um, and then I got to go to the Denver regional office and work on some specific issues with um, some subject matter experts who'd been in the field for you know, 20, 30 years. And then I was able to go to the Indian Health Service in Phoenix, Arizona and work on a special project there, um, sort of collaborating between the Indian Health Service and the Veterans Affairs Office in Phoenix. So I just had a lot of support at CMS for my program. And it was able, like I said, to just sort of really design something that was unique to me and that really sort of um, emphasized my skills and brought me a lot of really great field experience that I hadn't had since I actually started at central office. I really needed field experience. So it was able to, to get that. And I think it's made me a much better policy advocate. Um, 
I have spent most of my career working on policy and regulations, but I did recently take over one of our contracts. So I am now splitting time between policy and contract work. But on policy, I work on a lot of talking points for senior leadership engagement for tribal audiences. Um, I run a lot of reports for our offices activities uh, for our tribal advisory groups. So those are sort of quarterly or three times a year or annual. So a lot of sort of tallying and keeping track of the work that our office does, which is we are a, a strong force of seven and we do um, like everybody at CMS, everyone wears lots of hats. So we do, we do a lot of work for a very few amount of people. I work on a lot of different internal policy groups at CMS sort of um, monitoring for tribal issues and then sort of chiming in on that because it is a really specific policy and legal area. So we have, like I said, we have one office and we're kind of a one-stop shop for everything tribal related. I do review regulations from all over the agency and the department with HHS um, for anything that has tribal impact and then kind of run that past my colleagues or other people in the agency to try to make sure that the tribal voice is heard. Um, before COVID, I did a fair amount of travel, like everybody in our office does, to trainings that our office organizes for tribal business office folks, and then conferences that we attend to do speaking engagements, and also tribal consultations, which is when we engage on a government-to-government -government level between the federal government and tribal leaderships as tribal governments. So that's incredibly important and, and really a big part of what we do. Uh, I, I maintain our tribal affairs mailbox, responding to lots of policy questions. And for my contract work, I'm a contract officer representative and I run the contract for the field trainings that we provide, which allow um, continuing education credits for our attendees. Typically these trainings take place all over Indian country, um, but currently we are doing these virtually, of course. Um, and I just wanted to end with anything that I really love about working at CMS or just sort of the overall experience. And I have to say it really, CMS is really good about promoting a work-life balance. Um, coming off of a really challenging um, educational program, I, I realized I didn't wanna work 80 hours a week. <laughs> and CMS gives you an opportunity to feel like you're making an impact, your day is really full, um, but they really encourage that, that balance. They, they want you to leave your work at work. And that was something that I was really looking for. I actually work full-time from home, so I can be closer to family in a different part of the country than Baltimore, because I was not from there, and uh, it was hard to put down roots in a new place, um, and so they are really great about promoting telework flexibility. I know everybody's doing that right now, but I was doing it before COVID, and they're really, really supportive as an agency, and like any federal job, um, fantastic benefits, um, great sick vacation time um, that increase the longer you work in the government. Um, and I um, am maternity leave because I, I am pregnant. So that has just recently become very important to me. So um, the federal government is now offering maternity, which is not something that you find in most jobs. So that's just sort of a quick um, overview of my background and, and why I came to CMS and what I do here. So I'm around for any questions you have at the end of the, in the presentation. Thanks, Marla. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rachel. And congratulations. I didn't know what your practice Thank you. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I think Rachel's story um, kind of speaks to a lot of us. So some of us on the call might be, you know, students or folks who have recently graduated. So as she mentioned, I will talk more about the program that she came in through along with our other programs for students and recent graduates. So definitely appreciate you sharing your story. Um, and also want to note that while the folks um, on our call today are, as I mentioned, from the American Indian and Alaska Native ERG Employee Resource Group, we do have employee resource groups for basically all contingencies um, of kind of like the American population. So we have an African American Employee Resource Group, we have an Hispanic Resource Group, we have an Asian American Pacific Islander Resource Group. So kind of everything, and that's not even all of them, just giving you an example that we, we have others as well. So with that, I want to get into um, federal resumes. Uh, so I am going to kind of kind of breeze over this information rather quickly, uh, just in the interest of time, as well as the fact that you'll be getting the slides afterwards. Um, but I will point out that this is kind of a, a shortened version of a full length webinar that we do have on federal resumes. So that can be found again on our YouTube channel. Um, uh, from a previously recorded webinar, we have a whole webinar on federal resumes. 
So that being said, what you may have been taught in school or elsewhere um, is to try to keep your resume to like one or two pages um, that most organizations will want that. And that may be true and probably is true for the private sector. Um, but for federal resumes, they do tend to be a bit longer. So please, what I encourage um, anybody to do is to keep that one or two page private industry resume, but then create a separate resume if you're applying to federal jobs. That resume typically is a little longer in length. That said, if you're just coming out of school or maybe you're a student and you only have like one internship and not a whole lot to fill your resume with, that's okay. I'm not suggesting it has to be three to five pages. Um, just suggesting if you do have the experience to fill up a longer resume, then include more than less. Um, so again, three to five pages is completely acceptable, even a little longer than that. I wouldn't go too much longer than that when you get into the 10 to 15 page range, unless you are in certain professions. So for instance, medical professionals might have publications that they have to list at the end of their resume or CV, that's a different story. But for the general kind of professional, um, three to five, three to six pages is perfectly acceptable in the government. Um, the format, as you will realize um, in applying to different positions with different organizations, is very subjective as far as like what managers want to see, right? Some managers want to see bullets, some hate bullets, some like little small paragraphs. I would say most don't like a full page of text. Um, so we will be going over a suggested format in a few minutes. Um, it is not a required format for federal resumes, but it is what we have found um, kind of helps managers uh, focus in on what they're really looking for in resumes. So what you'll see an example here in this um, third uh, row here is uh, you have like a, a skill set that is the header of a small paragraph. Right. And so that draws the manager in. If they know they're looking for a database administrator, very clear in all caps that this is what I'm looking for. And then here's a few sentences about that. Um, so we'll go into more depth about that in a few minutes. Um, but generally speaking, we look for um, we are not looking for, excuse me, we're not really looking for keywords. Right. So the old adage is you have to go to the vacancy announcement, pull out the keywords, put them in your resume because the system or it's scanning and looking for that. That's not really the case. The, our uh, application system does not scan for keywords. Um, so all of our applications are read by our human resource professionals. Um, again, I mentioned format, we'll go into that in a little bit. Um, and then almost all of our positions, you're gonna have to submit your uh, resume through USA Jobs for a formal application. There are some exceptions to that, but generally speaking, all of our positions are hired through USA Jobs. Um, and that being said, when you're on USA Jobs, we'll go over this um, during the next topic, but there is a resume builder. So in USA Jobs, you can either upload a current resume or you can build your resume through USA Jobs. So, yeah, this slide is really just to highlight the fact that um, one size doesn't necessarily fit all with resumes, right? So you might have to have several versions of your of a resume in for different target positions, right? So some people, like Rachel, you know, she has a, a legal background as well as now a health policy background. So she was applying to new jobs right now. Depending on the job she's applying to, she might highlight different areas within her expertise within her background um, and highlight them in a different way depending on what she is applying to and potentially highlight one area more than another. So go into more detail. If she's applying now to be an attorney at a law firm, let's not that she's ever gonna leave CMS, but just in case, um, she might highlight that experience more so or more in depth than she would um, like her health policy experience here. So just an example. But in general, your resume should definitely communicate your qualifications. It can, it should and uh, will definitely help you if you provide what type of immediate results you have experience with or have helped an organization attain. And just a reminder that it really conveys your first impression. So this is your first um, entryway into the hiring manager's point of view. So if it's not a good impression, then chances are you probably won't even make it to the interview phase. Um, and then all, 
elements that should uh, be maintained in any resume, no matter the format, is consistency in formatting, right? So if you have all of your position titles bolded and underlined, make sure that is consistent without whatever it looks like for your resume, clutter-free and easy to read. So we'll get into that formatting a little bit here. Um, but as I mentioned, the Okay, so the targeted resume, as I mentioned with Rachel's example, is really just saying that you might need to tweak your resume a little bit, depending on the position that you're applying for, to catch your audience's attention. And your audience, obviously, is the hiring manager. Our human resources, and we'll go over this more in the USA Jobs portion, you have to touch on certain things depending on the qualification requirements, and that's what human resources is going to be looking for. In order to be forwarded to the manager, you have to kind of explain everything that's required um, in your resume. But once you get over that hurdle, you have to stand out enough to make the one the manager want to call you for an interview. Um, so that's why targeting your resume is really important. So I mentioned the suggested format. Um, again, not a required format. You don't have to run to your resume and completely spend weeks redoing it in this format. But if you are looking kind of for a revamp or maybe just starting out, this is a good uh, format to consider. And so as I mentioned, it's called the outline format. And it takes those keywords or skill sets, puts them in all caps as kind of a header for a, each small paragraph. Um, another thing you'll see with that is you will see at the very bottom, it's kind of cut off, but you'll see the term key accomplishments and then some bullets under that. So this particular format suggests that you separate out your accomplishments from your actual experience. Um, and it kind of makes them stand out more and makes you look more impressive. <laughs> um, so with that being said, I just want to point out that this particular format you can do for each experience that you have. Some of them might duplicate. So if you've had multiple positions in kind of the similar industry, some of your headers might be duplicative if you have multiple positions um, within the same industry. So for instance, in this case, project management. Um, you know, so he had, this particular person has project management in his most recent experience. Um, but then if he had, you know, the job before that, if he had it, you can put that again. Again, the paragraph is going to be the small kind of what you did within that, uh, the realm of that header or that, that skill set. Um, and again, this kind of takes away. So what we see as HR professionals, sometimes we see resumes that come in and an entire half a page is just all text. Sometimes an entire full page is all text. And it is very cumbersome for not only HR, but really the hiring manager to read, especially if they're getting 40, 50, 100 resumes to get. If there's a, a resume that comes through and it's just big block text without anything to direct their eyes or to pull their attention, sometimes it's cumbersome enough for them to put it in the side and say, maybe I'll come back to that one. Um, so you definitely don't want to fall into that trap. Um, some important things to note within a federal resume that may differ um, from private indus industry resumes. Um, it is imperative that you include the month and the year for each experience that you list. Um, the reason being is for most federal positions, it requires at least one year full-time work if you are trying to qualify for a certain grade level with experience as opposed to education. So with education, it's a little different, um, but with experience, if you're qualifying based on previous experience, if you don't put that month in the year and you just put 2018 to 2019, HR doesn't know whether that's December 2018 to February 2019 or if that's over a year. Um, so you definitely have to include the month and the year as well as the hours per week. So again, it's one year full-time work. So if you are only working 20 hours a week, they can count that experience, but they will have to add that up with other experience to make it one year full-time work. Um, another thing is if you have been with an organization for some time and you have progressively maybe gotten promotions within that organizations and have progressively more responsibilities, separate that out, separate that experience out even within the same company. For instance, I have been at CMS for almost 21 years um, since I was a high school intern. So obviously within that time frame, I started off as a GS1 um, and you know, completed my internship, graduated, then you know, progressed in my career, <clears throat> excuse me, after college. So I have 
although I have been in basically the same position and same division, I have it separated out into different kind of levels of responsibility. For the federal government, it's it's easier because it's grade levels. Um, but for private industry, you can just separate out those levels of responsibility when you get promoted in that sense. <clears throat> Um, and excuse me, if you are, and the last thing is, if you are qualifying on experience, as I mentioned, you can, some positions you can qualify on education, some positions you can qualify on experience, some you can combine the two. Um, you want to take note of the specialized experience in the vacancy announcement and make sure you include that on your resume. We'll go over uh, more detail with that uh, in the next section. And then just to finish up, there's a couple of do's and don'ts we have just from kind of the years of seeing resumes, some things to make sure you want to include and some things to avoid. Um, so some things you definitely want to include is quantifying whenever possible, right? So if I manage a budget uh, for our recruitment expenses, that sounds great. But a manager, if I'm applying to a position, doesn't know if I manage a budget of $20,000 or $2 million. Um, so quantifying in that sense whenever possible is definitely going to be helpful. Um, obviously, you want to make sure your resume is error free. I, uh, I kind of go by the rule of three here. So I want three pairs of eyes on my resume if I'm making any significant changes to it, or especially if I'm just creating one for the first time. I want at least three to pairs of eyes on it, preferably preferably people that write well. <laughs> um, uh, again, we already kind of went over the fact of tailoring your resume. Again, sometimes just small tweaks can be really helpful with that throughout the application process. And of course, timely and complete. When you're submitting your application on USA Jobs, <clears throat> each job will have a specific deadline that you must meet to the minute, right? So 11.59 on October 21st, 2021. <clears throat> so make sure that your application is timely and it is complete with all required documents. And then lastly, um, some things you might want to avoid in your federal resume. Um, so this is not a hard and fast rule, but job description expressions like duties include, responsibilities are, and just listing them out. Sometimes the manager won't care. Sometimes it doesn't go over too well. So if instead you just just Google the phrase accomplishment oriented phrases um, and you'll have, see any number of websites that come up with examples of what that means and try to include some of those on your resume. Obviously, you never want to embellish or inflate um, any of your accomplishments, level of responsibility, your skill sets, <coughs> your experiences, <coughs> excuse me, um, on your resume. You never want to lie. Um, you don't have to, you, you should not include personal information, pictures, definitely please don't include pictures, your age, your date of birth, your race, and, um, race or ethnicity. <coughs> Excuse me, one second. I tried to get through, I was one slide away from that cough attack. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, the one resume, right? So you wanna tailor your resume. We keep honing in on that for a reason because it is gonna be very helpful for you in the application process. So with that, that is just um, a very quick um, kind of overview of our federal resumes. Um, like I mentioned, we do have a slightly more in-depth presentation on YouTube, um, but hopefully that was helpful and you will get these slides after the fact. But now I wanna move on to our next uh, volunteer today. Um, Georgie Sparks also works in our Center for Medicaid and SHIP Operations, and she is gonna share her story. So Georgie. Thank you, Marla. And I hope you all can hear me. Um, yeah. I want to say um, I'm at the end of my federal career, but those of you who are considering join, joining uh, federal service, I applaud you. Because, be, because being a federal employee, you're giving back to our country. Um, I always equate being a federal employee is uh, serving uh, the public, is a public service position. So those of you who are considering uh, CMS or other federal agency, I applaud you. And I'm happy to speak today uh, with the emphasis on uh, the minority service institutions. Even though uh, I'm an American Indian, 
I'm actually a member of the Rosebud Sioux Tribe from South Dakota. I am actually a graduate of an HBCU, Morgan State University, so go Bears. I have, uh, this past summer, I celebrated 31 years of federal sub service and uh, plan to, in, to retire uh, soon. I'll be 70 next spring, so I think it's time to uh, leave federal service and open up a slot for someone else to join uh, this journey. I emphasize the number of years because I did not know about CMS nor its mission. Um, I happened uh, to come across CMS only because of a personal need uh, to be closer to home rather than in Washington, DC. So I joined CMS nearly 11 years ago. Actually, uh, in two weeks, I'll be celebrating my 11th year here at CMS. And when I joined CMS, I was um, excited, but also nervous because um, health insurance uh, was not in my uh, bag of expertise or experience. And I didn't know what I was walking into. But the first day that I joined CMS, uh, I actually had to, I actually got to watch the making of a PSA, a public service announcement that was aired across ABC affiliates in this country. And it was the filming of the 1964 uh, Olympic star in Indian country, Billy Mills. So to actually see him uh, record a PSA and actually have lunch with him that day uh, made me fall in love with CMS just that first uh, four or five hours. And then to learn about the mission of CMS, um, many of us in minority or more minority communities, we don't understand the impact that this agency, CMS has in our communities. So I applaud you, uh, those of you who are considering joining CMS because you are going to be joining an agency that really serves our communities, mostly um, unknown to the beneficiaries. And that's who we call, that's what we call uh, those who receive services uh, under Medicare, Medicaid, Children's Health Insurance Program, as well as the health insurance marketplace. Those are our uh, target audience in any seat that we sit in at CMS. Uh, our mission is embedded through every one of us that work at CMS. So I wanna say thank you uh, for joining today. And um, 31 years ago, when I uh, submitted my federal resume, it wasn't through this wonderful tool that is called USA Jobs. I actually um, recent, recently looked at my uh, personnel folder and my job application back 31 plus years ago was actually over 30 pages. And it was on a required form called SF-151. So what Marla shared with you and is sharing today and all these workshop Wednesday, Wednesdays is giving you uh, extra uh, knowledge and uh, skills to hone those uh, applications to become a member of the federal service. So thank you. Thank you so much, Georgie. That is uh, very cool about your first day in that PSA. I didn't know that story. It's awesome. Um, and thank you for your three plus decades of service. That, that's amazing. Um, so again, just kind of want you to hear from all walks of life here, right? So Rachel just recently joined us, um, you know, within the last 10 years and, and Georgie will be retiring soon. So it's a kind of a great gamut of our career life um, that you're hearing today. 
Um, so as Georgie mentioned, um, things have changed a lot um, with the applications over the last several years, even since I've been in, well, I've been in the government for 21 years now, um, but even since I've been here, um, I've seen kind of the evolution <clears throat> of our application process. So if you are at all familiar with um, federal hiring or federal agencies and, and applying in general, you have probably at least heard of USA Jobs. It is where <clears throat> all federal agencies are required to post most of their positions. Um, as I mentioned before, there are some exceptions to that, but for the vast majority of federal positions, they are posted on USA Jobs. <clears throat> Um, so when you go on USA Jobs, if you don't already have a profile, it will seem a little cumbersome at first. It is a very, very, very large website. Um, but when you take it step by step, you'll kind of work your way through it and kind of get used to uh, the workings of the system. So the first thing I want to point out here is when you do create a profile for yourself, which I'll go over um, in a second, the, the the big red arrow on this home page is to make your resume searchable. When you are creating your profile, that will be one option. Um, so in addition, the traditional way you use USA Jobs is to search for and directly apply to open positions. <clears throat> um, one of the newer features to USA Jobs is it allows, it also allows federal agencies to kind of search the system and kind of source for applicants that they might be recruiting and encourage them to apply to vacancies that are posted. So making your resume searchable allows for recruiters and or hiring managers to source uh, for people with your background or skill sets that they may be looking for. And again, encourage you to apply to announcements. So make sure you make your resume searchable when you see that option on your profile. Um, but to kind of take it one step back, um, so again, you access USA Jobs, you're going to create your profile, it's going to prompt you for a lot of different kind of demographic information. Um, and then you'll be able to create or store up to five different resumes. So here's where that tailoring your resume comes into play via USA Jobs, you can create, you can uh, store up to five different versions of your resume on here. <clears throat> um, and as I mentioned, it says create or store because you can upload your resume that you currently have, or you can use the USA Jobs Resume Builder to build your resume. So all of the things that I mentioned that are really important for federal resumes, like the month and the year, the hours per week, all of that kind of stuff is prompted in the USA Jobs Resume Builder, you're going to be prompted for all of that information. So you definitely won't miss out on anything. Um, but again, you are able to upload current resumes if you choose to do that as well. <clears throat> and then lastly, you're able to attach <clears throat> up to 10 documents um, to your application. So for that's going to be like supporting uh, document information. If, for instance, you are using education to qualify for a position, you're going to have to upload a transcript. Um, if you are a veteran claiming any type of veteran's preference, you need to upload your veterans um, discharge documents and any disability documents. If you are an individual with a disability and want to um, apply through the Schedule A hiring authority, you must upload your Schedule A letter. So those are just some examples of um, the, the attachments or the supporting documentation that you might upload to USA Jobs to your profile. Um, okay, so now we're past the point, we've made our profile, we have our documents uploaded, now what? Um, so as I mentioned, the main way that USA Jobs is used is as a search feature to search for and apply for open positions. They have probably a dozen or so different filters that you can use to narrow down the types of positions that you're looking for. <clears throat> um, but the what the kind of first way you can narrow it down is just by a keyword search. You can do a keyword and add a location if you're looking for a specific geographic location, and then all the positions that match that keyword. Now, depending on what keyword you use, that could produce a lot of results. So you may want to kind of drill down a little farther and use their uh, predetermined filters. The filters are uh, can be by hiring path, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, the departments or agencies, the job series, um, that's the type of occupation it is, um, the salary. So there's a, a lot of different filters you use to kind of narrow down what you're to, to really determine what you're looking for. Um, and then the last thing I want to point out on this particular page, on this particular slide is the last thing that's a save search. So once you have done a few searches and the, the results that are produced 
really fits your needs. So these are the type of positions that you're really looking to, to, to apply to. You can actually save that search in the system and request to be notified anytime a position is posted that meets that criteria that you save. So let's just say I'm a entry level, I'm just graduating, I'm looking for recent graduate opportunities, I graduated with an accounting degree, so I want to be an accountant, and I want to work in Washington, D.C., right? So you can set all that criteria up so that any position that is posted within the federal government that's for recent grads, uh, that's an accountant and in D.C., that will send you an email every time that happens, or you can get the emails weekly, and I think there's one other cadence that you Um, so I mentioned hiring paths as one of the filters, and this is a really um, great filter to use. It's a relatively new feature on USA Jobs, um, and it really helps to get to the positions that you are going to be eligible for as a candidate, right? So the first one, top left, is pretty self-explanatory. It's open to the general public. Um, <clears throat> so you can always select that one. But then if you fit into any of these other categories, you can also search by that. So if you are a student or a recent graduate, and we define recent graduate as within two years typically of graduation, um, there are some exceptions to that for um, certain veterans. Um, but let's just say for, for, for this sake, we're saying two years uh, outside of your last degree, um, and that can that two years starts over with every degree that you may get. So let's say you got a bachelor's degree three years ago, and this past year you got a master's degree, then it resets. So it's with your master's degree from two years. You can choose the hiring path students or recent graduates and kind of narrow down the search results to only show positions that are open to students and recent graduates. Same with military spouse, veterans, current federal employees, individuals with disabilities, so Native Americans, the list goes on. So you can narrow down your um, uh, hiring paths of what you may be eligible to apply to. So that being said, I wanna get into a little bit more detail about the vacancy announcement itself, because this is where some people start to get a little confused, and if not confused, just maybe a little overwhelmed. Um, the vacancy announcements, um, while they can be a little overwhelming to read through and, and make sure you comprehend, it is so important for you to actually read through it, right? So it may take a little time, um, but reading through the entire vacancy announcement is crucial um, because there are, depending on the federal agency and how they format their vacancy announcements, there might be crucial information in different sections that you're maybe not typically used to reading or just maybe that's normally just standard language, but they might throw a line in there that's crucial to that particular application. So just make sure no matter what it is, what agency you're applying to, to read through every vacancy. Um, when you open a vacancy, this is what you'll see at the top of the screen. It is kind of like overview or summary information at the top. The right-hand side is where it says this job is open to recent graduates. That is where the hiring paths are. So you'll see a list. If it's multiple hiring paths, you'll see those as well, um, all on the right-hand side. Um, so as you go down the first kind of section that you will come to is the duty section. Um, and this is... a uh, a relatively important section, but not the most important. Um, but the responsibility section is a good place to kind of look at to see if the job is a good fit for you. It's not necessarily talking about any qualification requirements, about what you need, um, but from your point of view as a candidate, do I want to do this type of work? Um, that's where you're gonna find um, kind of a description of the day-to-day -day duties. That being said, I do want to caution you that sometimes agencies, including CMS, will post agency-wide announcements or announcements that may not be specific to one particular job. So for instance, we um, recruit for our recent graduates program and our student programs through a few vacancy announcements that are made available to any federal, federal hiring manager within our agency that wants to hire through this program. Right, so we may post, let's just say, a program analyst position, um, <clears throat> and while it may appear to be one position, we could make 20 hires from that particular vacancy, and those 20 hires could go into 20 different departments within our organization. 
So I say all that in this particular slide to say that sometimes the responsibilities, those day-to-day -day duties may not be a um, great description of what you'll actually be doing day to day. Sometimes it's a more generalized posting because it's going to be made available to many hiring managers. <laughs> Um, and a good way to kind of determine that is if when it says um, how many vacancies are going to be filled, if it says just one, then the responsibilities are probably going to be pretty detailed and in line with what you'll be doing. If it says anything like a few or many um, vacancies will be filled, then it's possible that that particular section may not be as descriptive as some others. <clears throat> So I want to get into the qualification section. Um, so in the requirements slash qualification section, you will see um, a few things. So one is an eligibility piece, right? So if you are applying to a specific program, for instance, our recent graduates program or our summer intern program, <clears throat> there will be a section for your eligibility. So not only do you have to be qualified for the position, um, and I'll talk about that in a second, you have to be eligible. So for instance, our recent grads program, we'll talk about pathways more um, towards the end. I'm gonna speed it up. I just got a glimpse of my time here. Um, the, the eligibility section will say exactly what you need or where you need to be um, in your either studies or career to be eligible for that particular program. So our recent grad, you have to be within two years of your last degree. Uh, the qualification section and the experience section is what you want to um, pay attention to in relation to your resume. Um, so once you determine whether you're eligible to apply and, and every position might not have that eligibility, it could be, you know, for our regular positions, a lot of time that eligibility might not be there or it won't have that level of detail. Um, but the qualification section is always going to have either experience, education, or a combination of the two, right? So the first thing you come across is the specialized experience. Most of the time, what it will say is what it says right here. You must demonstrate in your resume at least one year, i.e. 52 weeks, that's what we've talked about, of qualifying specialized experience equivalent to the next, typically it's the next lower grade level in the federal government obtained either in the private or public sector. So basically all this is saying is, if you don't know what a GS-5 or a GS-7 is and you're not, you're not already in the government, here's what you need to have obtained or the skill sets or experience you need to have in order to qualify for this position. And then it will be numbered, literally one, two, three. Um, sometimes there's three, sometimes there might be two or four, um, but typically there's three statements here. So this one says preparing segments of information for inclusion into routine policies, guidelines, um, procedures for administrative or management requirements, right? So this is just an example of one of our recent graduate postings. As you go up in grade level, so if you're more of a mid-career professional, you're not applying to recent graduate opportunities, this specialized experience will be more um, detailed. It will be more specific uh, to the position that you're applying to. <clears throat> um, in addition to that, you, in some positions and some grade levels, you can substitute education for experience. So if you uh, again, I encourage you to just read the vacancy announcements fully <clears throat> because sometimes you may not need that specialized experience if you have the required education. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. Okay, I'm back. Um, Okay, so moving on, <laughs> excuse me. Um, so in kind of summary of what we, some of the things we just talked about, the qualifications in that section has to be reflected in your resume somewhere. Um, again, the education can be substituted for that, but generally speaking, your qualification, the, um, the uh, specified experience, it has to be reflected in your resume. Resumes, again, should be amended to ensure those qualifications are stated for each position you're applying to. That's where that tailoring of your resume comes in. And most importantly, human resources will not make assumptions, right? So they're not going to assume that because you were this position title that you must have done this work. It has to be reflected in your resume somewhere and you must be clear. Um, and then last but not least on the USA job section, um, 
each <clears throat> uh, position you apply to will come with some sort of assessment. Um, most of our positions, um, if you look at the bottom right side of the slide, it will look like this. So most of our assessments are an, an occupational questionnaire that you can actually view ahead of time before actually pressing the apply button. So that big arrow that says preview occupational questionnaire, <clears throat> that's going to that link at the bottom of the screen, you'll see that under the qualification section for CMS positions. If you do that, you click that, you can just kind of view <clears throat> the application questions that will all be multiple choice um, and you'll have to answer when you actually click the apply button. There will be some positions that you apply to now um, that have a slightly different assessment tool other than that kind of multiple choice questions. Um, so it will look like this and you'll know um, because it will look like this in the qualification section. Um, about the assessment. So it will say something like you will be assessed for the following competencies and then have a list of those competencies. That assessment tool, um, if you see that on a vacancy announcement, it is going to take more time. So I would suggest um, while you can save it throughout when you're taking it, um, leave yourself a significant amount of time to apply to those um, positions that you may see this wording for assessment. So with that, I am going to take another quick break before we go into our last um, topic and introduce Dr. Susan Carroll, who also works in our Center for Medicaid and CHIP uh, Services. So Dr. Carroll. Thank you, Marla, and good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Susan Carroll. I'm also Captain Susan Carroll. I, I can wear a few hats and I have um, come here as the CMO, the Chief Medical Officer for the Division of Tribal Affairs, much like Rachel and Georgie have um, come from the same division. Um, I've been in my position now for five years. It's been a quick five years, happened very quickly. Um, I'm an enrolled member of the Tuscarora Indian Nation. And a big part of my um, federal career started with the Indian Health Service. Um, and in that position, I learned very quickly that CMS was an agency that I needed to spend time with. Um, when I went to medical school, I have to say, nobody teaches you about CMS, about Medicare, Medicaid. Um, and so coming to CMS was, it was really enlightening. It was eye-opening. Um, I have been here now five years, um, a total of 15 years in the government. And I have learned a lot about the C's, the M's, and the S's. Um, it, it can be very confusing sometimes, but I think um, it, it's a great, a, a great agency. Each aspect of those CMNSs um, are, are very helpful. Um, I have had the opportunity to learn about the billing of Medicare and Medicaid, and that's been greatly beneficial for our tribal partners who um, have um, been working hard to enroll in our programs, and we serve as a point of contact for the tribes to help them with their questions about CMS. We have had a lot of outreach and education um, that we've been working on, and that part has been truly enlightening also for me to learn the different aspects um, of CMS. And I have to say the agency has been a, a great place for me um, learning all this different inf information and um, getting to know healthcare from a very different perspective and also helping to impact some of the policy that our country develops for healthcare. Um, I wanted to mention very quickly, I know time's short, that there is the CMS American Indian and Alaska Native Resource Group, which is a strategic partner with CMS to promote um, a culture of diversity and inclusion through continual, continuing learning, mentorship, and stewardship. Our ERG is a valuable mechanism for us to build culture that fosters diversity and inclusion, offers employees access to, to, access to um, groups of leadership opportunities, and it establishes programs and activities aligned um, with the CMS mission. Um, the ERG provides development, growth, and mentorship opportunities, and it is a unique perspective um, and, and hopefully has innovative solutions to challenges faced by CMS. 
The goals of our ERG are to support employee participation, to utilize the expertise of um, the members to, uh, out, to do outreach um, to diverse organizations, to advise CMS on how to eliminate barriers that might be related to hiring, retention, and promotion of all employees in the CMS workforce, which is one reason why we're here today to help support um, Marla and her recruitment efforts. We also serve as mentors in CMS-sponsored programs, and our, our membership for our ERG is totally voluntary and it's available to everyone. I have to say, I know time is close, so I wanna thank Marla for this great webinar. There's a lot of wonderful information here. I'll close by, say, by thanking you for listening to me, and we are all available if you have any questions. Back to you, Marla. Thank you so much, Dr. Caro, and, and thanks for kind of going into a little bit about your employee resource group as well. I think that's very beneficial and um, just given the breadth of our employee resource groups at our agency, I think just goes to um, further our point that we really, really value diversity and inclusion in CMS. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Um, so we are going to finish out um, with our last topic here. We are running low on time, so I'm going to breeze through this. Um, and then, like I said, if you do have any questions, feel free to throw them in the Q&A. I know that um, one particular um, listener in today was wanting clarification on um, something that I said on our last topic. We're not quite sure exactly what uh, you're referring to, but feel free to email our, our recruitment mailbox. Sean will give you that address. Um, for further information. Um, so with that being said, our Pathways programs for students and recent graduates, um, there are three tiers to our Pathways programs. So the first one is our internship program that is for current students. Second tier is for our recent graduates program, again, for individuals who have graduated within the previous two years. And as Rachel mentioned earlier, the Presidential Management Fellows Program, and that is for advanced degree um, students or above, so master's or above. So I'll get into a little bit of detail with all um, three of these programs and how CMS uh, runs the programs at our agency. Um, so our internship program gives students the exposure to civil service um, during the summer months. So we run our internship program uh, initially through our summer internship program. So that is how we hire most of our interns into our agency for the summer months. So late May through early September, that is negotiable depending on your school year and, and when you're available. Um, students must possess at least a 3.0 GPA and be enrolled at least half time and US citizenship is required for all of our pathways programs. Um, the program itself is uh, typically about 12 weeks or so. It is full time and it is paid. Um, in addition to that, some students um, may be eligible for employment past the summer um, or conversion to permanent employment. Um, with promotions potential if, I'll say the stars align, right? So our summer intern program is centrally funded, um, but at the end of each summer, we assess our organization and our hiring departments to see who has vacancies to fill. And certainly if the manager that you may have entered with has a vacancy to fill and you are available to stay on throughout your school year, then that could happen, that extension could happen, and you could be converted to a, what we call a permanent intern. And if that isn't the case, then we do try to match students, maybe managers who have vacancies that didn't have summer interns, and then summer interns who are available to stay, but maybe their manager doesn't have a vacancy, we do our best to uh, match those up as well. So we do have a pretty high retention rate of our summer interns um, staying on board throughout the school year and then eventually getting converted to permanent employees. Um, our summer intern announcements are typically posted to USA Jobs in January of every year. We do have one uh, summer intern position currently posted, and that is for uh, our actuarial department. So if you are kind of a math, STEM, actuary, economist, that type of student, and you're looking for a summer internship, we do have a position currently posted, um, and the rest will be posted in early January. If you just do a keyword search on USA Jobs for CMS internship, um, that is where you will be able to find um, uh, all of our summer intern vacancies when they are available. Um, in addition to that, you can also monitor the CMS website that is hyperlinked because, again, you will get these slides after the fact. Um, and as I already mentioned, it is a full-time paid about 12 weeks over the summer. 
<clears throat> Our recent graduates program, again, is available to um, folks who have graduated from a qualifying institutional program within the last two years. Um, you must be a U.S. citizen. It is a one-year entry-level hiring program, but I don't want to misconstrue it to make it sound like you will be training in some separate organization for a year. Um, it is on the job training. So whatever department hires you, you are training right alongside with your colleagues. Um, it is just uh, the way we bring on a lot of folks into the government who maybe don't have a lot of experience but have just recently graduated. Um, appointments are made at the GS7 or GS9 levels, um, so this is not a, uh, a definite, but generally speaking, if you have graduated, um, a 3.0 GPA is also required. If you have graduated with a bachelor's degree and a 3.0 GPA, generally speaking, you would typically qualify for a GS7, and if you um, just graduated with a master's degree, um, you typically qualify for a GS9 position. We post our recent graduate announcements every semester, and we stagger those postings throughout the entire semester, traditional college semester. So we um, have postings that are available September, October, November, and then in the spring semester, February, March, and April. Uh, so you will see those every semester. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, we make those uh, positions available to any hiring manager that wants to hire through this program. Uh, so it kind of depends on uh, the hiring need at our agency at any given time. We are projecting some increased hiring in the near future. So if you are coming up, at, if you have recently graduated in the past two years, or you are either graduating this semester or you're graduating next semester, I certainly encourage you to apply um, to the positions you are allowed to apply within your last semester. Uh, so for instance, if you are graduating this December, then you can apply to our positions that are posted this month and next month. Um, the same thing for the spring. If you're graduating in May, then you can apply for the positions that we post in the next spring semester, uh, February, March, and April. Again, I mentioned the 3.0 cumulative GPA is required. Um, and then lastly, just going to wrap up here in the next minute or two, the Presidential Management Fellows Program is a two-year leadership development program. It is coordinated centrally by the Office of Personnel Management. Um, you can find all the information at www.pmf.gov. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the, the um, application timeframe has closed for this year. Um, but if you are looking um, either... <clears throat> graduating with your master's degree or above, let's say in May next year, um, or you're looking to start a master's program, this is a program you definitely want to consider. Um, it is a pretty prestigious program and very competitive, uh, but the Office of Personnel Management uh, recruits for the program once per year, uh, every October. It's typically open for about two or three weeks. Again, it just closed uh, last week, I believe. Um, we make appointments at the GS9 or GS11 levels. Um, and again, all of our positions have what we call full performance levels. So basically all that means is once you convert out of the programs, you have the ability or the eligibility to be promoted up into the GS12 level um, without further competition, without having to reapply to anything. It's just uh, management kind of agreeing to that promotion. Um, and that being said, we do have a very robust Presidential Management Fellows Program at our agency. We've hired, I believe, about 30 PMFs um, in the last year. So that I think that makes us the third largest federal agency for the PMF program in the entire federal government. So we, we really value our PMFs. We're doing a lot more hiring these days. Um, so definitely encourage you. You have two years of eligibility to apply. The first year is the year you're about to graduate. So for instance, if you are graduating um, this May, then you could have applied this past round um, a few weeks ago. Um, but then you also have a second year of eligibility, the year you graduate with your master's degree. Um, you have one more year to apply. So I know I've raised through this information. Just a quick recap. Um, obviously, I've said it like a million times. So you want to create a targeted resume. Um, that doesn't mean you have to rewrite your resume for every position you apply to. Um, but creating a targeted resume, tweaking your resume here and there is definitely going to set you apart. Um, set up, make sure you set up your account at USA Jobs if you don't already have one and take the time to read every vacancy announcement. 
and then identify any programs that might be right for you. Uh, I mentioned the Pathways programs, and there are some others um, that you can look into as well. So with that, I um, just want to leave you with our uh, resource box. You can always email the recruitment team at cmsrecruitment at cms.hhs.gov with any questions that you have. Again, if you have any right now, feel free to use the Q&A box. Um, just want to extend a, a sincere thanks to all of our presenters today. I think kind of getting a glimpse into the, the, the program area at CMS is always a helpful um, insight uh, for applicants to have rather than me just spewing information. So thank you all for sharing your, um, your expertise and your stories with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, Reminder that everybody who has pre-registered is going to get these slides, a follow-up email with the slides, um, and also that this uh, recording will be posted to our YouTube channel during the first week in November. Um, and then just a quick uh, reminder to register for any of our upcoming webinars. So we host these webinars every first and third Wednesday. Um, the same link that you use to register for this webinar, you can go back and register for any of our remaining webinars. Um, that said, we will have another series in 2022. Um, it will be announced uh, probably in the next month or two. Uh, so you can look out for those as well. Um, but the, net, the very next webinar is our Federal Hiring 360 for veterans and the military community. So the topics will be similar to the topics gone over today, but there will be some more dedicated information and more specific information um, for veterans, military spouses, anybody in the military community. Um, so if you know anybody or if you are um, a veteran or within the military community, feel free to register or forward that information on to anybody that you know, um, and that will be taking place on November 3rd. So I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A box, so I will go ahead and end here. And thank you all so much for your participation today, and we hope you got a lot out of it. Thank you so much. <laughs>